and it's a hot topic, even an incendiary topic in some quarters. What could or should the Democratic Party have done differently to uh, bring in white working class voters who wound up in many cases uh, voting for Donald Trump instead? Well, our next guest has written a book about it. Joan Williams is a scholar of social inequality. She is the founding director at the Center for Work-Life Law and a distinguished professor of law at the University of California. Hastings College of Law, and her new book, which I am holding in my hand, is entitled White Working Class Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America. So first of all, Joan, thanks for coming on the program. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. And rather than me paraphrasing your central thesis, I'm sure you've uh, answered this question a thousand times, but what is the basic thesis of your book? The basic thesis is that American politics are being driven by a broken relationship, a broken relationship between what I call the professional managerial elite, the college educated elite, and the white working class. And this relationship has been going south since the 1970s, but the Trump election was really the nadir, I hope, of that relationship. So. I am a silver spoon girl, uh, born and bred, but I married into a white working class family nearly 40 years ago and have studied social inequality for decades. So I decided to try to explain to the college educated elite just why the white working class is so extremely angry that to quote one South Carolina voter, they voted with their middle finger. Yeah, you know, that voting with the middle finger is, a, is certainly an evocative quote. And I know someone said to me uh, uh, that they felt that many Trump voters were throwing a brick through the window of American politics. And I remember my answer was, or a grenade, you know, that there's really, a, really is a great deal of anger out there. Well, let's start with this because I, because I, you know, I think your point is rooted in the concept of social inequality. What is social inequality? Social inequality is that American society, like all societies, has um, an invisible escalator for certain groups and serious headwinds for other groups. Most people who are interested in social inequality study one thing, they're gender people or race people or class people. I think what I bring, which is different, is that I study um, different vectors of social inequality all at once. So, in effect, the way they work in concert with one another to perpetuate or generate social inequality. Um, okay. And the way different vectors of social inequality often end up with different disenfranchised groups at each other's throats. Well, and this is something that I think is central to the debate over what might have been done differently, uh, in, let's say, in the 2016 election to... Uh, perhaps bring some of these uh, Trump voters into the Democratic column, for example. One of the things, since you're talking about the different vectors or forces involved in social inequality, one of the things that's always struck me is that there is a, it seems to me that there's a faction in the Democratic Party, and you could say it's driven by the professional managerial elite, uh, but not all of them, of course, but th there is a certain faction, it seems to me, within the Democratic Party that wants to posit that identity issues, whether they're race or gender, uh, are, are somehow distinct and separate from, let's say, economic or class issues when, when class issues or economic issues are going to primarily, in many cases, hit women and minorities harder, for example. So I've, I've found sometimes the, the, that there's an artificial uh, fractioning off of populations that take takes place. Do you, do you agree with that? And is that in any way uh, part of your, your argument in this book? Well, I think that certainly one of the reasons that Rush Limbaugh, for example, has become so popular in deriding political correctness is because we haven't included class as one of the ways that people are systematically disadvantaged in the United States. And there's often a lot of loose talk about white men and how white men are privileged. And 
um, uh, of, at, that's uh, you often forget in that discourse, and I've been part of that discourse. I spent a lot of time in corporate diversity with corporate diversity initi initiative people. Um, we forget that being a white man who is a blue collar guy um, is also a form of social inequality. Now, what's more important, class or race or gender? This is a boring and unimportant question. It, this is not a zero sum game. The fact is um, all politics is about identity and that's true for white the white working class as well as everybody else. Uh, but I think that in it, focusing on um, other vectors and not talking about class, we're actually hurting the people we're trying to help. After all, having Jeff Sessions as attorney general is not helping right. the LGBTQ community. Right, and I guess my, my, I think we're saying the same thing, Joan Williams, and again, Joan Williams is the author of the new book, A White Working Class, which is that I think it's not only counterproductive to argue which is more important, I think in a sense, it, it, it's really, there's an incoherence to it because I don't think they can even be separated. I think there's a intersectionality, if you want to use those words. You can't say is class more important, is race more important, is gender more important. They are all aspects to me of an indivisible whole. There are different emphases on the same issues of power dynamics and relationships and who has a voice, giving everyone a voice. Uh, am I being overly idealistic in saying that? Well, I think you're coming out of a tradition that I actually have um, kind of resisted. Uh, and um, so I, I do come out of identity politics, but I, in many ways, I think this is um, an interesting intellectual frame, but not the most important political frame. I think that what we really have is that's driving American politics is what I call the class culture gap. And that Democrats, um, increasingly since the 70s, have been very, very focused on the, the cultural issues that are very precious to me and the likes of me. Um, everything from LGBTQ rights to abortion rights. Um, these are rights that are so important to me and my crowd because we are privileged people for whom self-development is it both um, a precious ideal and um, we feel very entitled to it. The white working class um, is not as focused on self-development, which after all, they don't have the same access to um, as the college educated elite does. They are more, much more focused on self-discipline. Because after all, you know, here in San Francisco, being disruptive can make you a billionaire. But if you're in a blue collar job, it just gets you fired is what right. being disruptive does. And so many of the issues that are very, very dear and central to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party um, are issues that reflect the realities of their lives as the college educated elite. And, you know, one important message of the book is we can't expect elite values from, from people to whom we haven't offered elite lives. And the strongest message I have for Democrats now is that the only way, both for ethical reasons and for tactical reasons, the only way um, forward is to put the economic future of Americans without college degrees ahead of some of these other cultural projects that I've dedicated my entire life to and I'm not diminishing the importance of. But by failing to address the economic hollowing out of the American middle class and the withering up of the future of Americans without college degrees, number one, I think as uh, as progressives and as Democrat, that's that's not who we are. I, I think that that should be at the center ethically, but I also think tactically, not putting at the center is uh, that that this economic agenda at the center is jeopardizing all of our other projects. And one of the things that Democrats have done, which I think, I mean, I've been a university professor since I was 28 years old, so I am not opposing the importance of college, but the fact is two-thirds of Americans are not 
college graduates. And um, a mind exploding fact for many in the professional managerial elite is that many of those people don't want to be college graduates. Mm -hmm. They want a path to a stable middle class job that leads can, that can sustain a stable family life as without a college degree. That's what they want. And um, again, the Democrats have, I think, become so uh, deeply identified with the college educated elite that they have forgotten how to talk to people who are focused on self-discipline and who want that solid job without a college degree. Well, you know, I first of all, I, I have to say, and again, we're talking with Joan Williams, uh, author of the new book, White Working Class, uh, that in some ways I would think it takes a certain amount of courage to uh, deliver that message because uh, while I fundamentally agree with it, I think there are a lot of people who, within the Democratic within democratic circles who react with a great deal of negativity to it, uh, at least in my experience, maybe, you know, it's just my experience is not. No, that's true. Yeah. It's not a comfortable cultural position I'm in, I'm in right now. Um, and I think my message is that I'm asking the professional managerial elite to give up some privilege um, because after all, it's their cultural projects that have been at the center of democratic ideals for quite a few decades now. And I'm saying um, that their cultural product projects, which are my cultural projects, projects, don't get me wrong, um, that for the good of the Republic um, and because of the their ethical obligation and our aspirations as progressives, we need to offer a, an economic future to people without college degrees, because after all, they just want what we as elites already have, which is a job that offers them a sta our, our vision of a middle class life. And so long as we don't do that, they're going to be voting with their middle finger. Yeah. And I, I, I love, by the way, I, I have to say, Joan, I love your um, your continued reference to the ethics of the situation, because a lot of the debate around white working class voters in, uh, in in democratic circles that I hear is focused on tactics and strategy, which is certainly extremely important. But I don't hear enough, in my opinion, said about the ethics of, first of all, not abandoning any group of voters. Secondly, recognizing that what will benefit these voters, working class itself is not a race specific term. There are black and brown working class voters, there are working class women, LGBT working class people come in all, all varieties. Uh, but, but so number one, the ethics of not abandoning a group of voters, and number two, recognizing that there is, beyond the issue of the white working class that's the subject of your book, uh, there is a working class, a broader working class, all of whom would benefit from the right policies. Is that on the right track as far as you're concerned? Absolutely. I mean, from the very beginning, part of our heritage in the United States is the way that, um, that that the people in charge have systematically pitted the white working class against um, first the black working class. This, this goes all the way back to um, pitting very consciously white indentured servants against mm -hmm. black slaves in the 17th century. This is a glorious American tradition. Um, it happened again after um, the, the Civil War when southern planters very consciously said to quote white trash you notice how people are being called garbage there mm -hmm. um at, you may be white trash but at least you're not black right uh, and my fear is that because of this broken relationship that i'm talking about between the cultural um the cultural liberals and the white working class that we're doing inadvertently what um, elites have done in throughout American history self-consciously, which has driven a wedge between the working class of color um, and the white working class. And we're basically playing into the other side's hands in a way that frankly is beneath us as intellectuals. I mean, we're not playing checkers here. We should be playing chess. Well, I think that's a, that's a great summary. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, I certainly agree with 
everything you said, Joan Williams. The book is White Working Class, Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America. And Joan, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation.